take off the surplus of those, and we put them on this dish, which I've kept covered because of the heat of the light, add the whole of the rest of that. I've left one or two bits behind, and now we go away and fry them. Now I just simply put them into the frying basket which Simon holds out for me over the hot oil, which is at the temperature, which I'm sure you will remember, um, 390 to 400, and never less. And then he fries them to a nice rich golden brown, while I take pieces of smoked haddock, about a pound and a half, cut into neat pieces, which fit in here, not any special shape, just cut up, into a not too deep pan. You want to get it wide rather than deep. And then I pour the amount of milk that is needed just to barely cover it, because I'm going to bring the milk to the boil and cook the fish in it. And therefore, as soon as the milk comes to the boil, it bubbles up, and then it makes that little foam on the top, which gives you the extra coverage. And then you cook this haddock for these scalloped haddocks that I told you I wanted to show you. You cook the haddock until it's tender, seven to ten minutes, depending on the thickness of the fillets when you fry. Now, this is the part we're not going to do together, because we can't wait for seven to ten minutes. When the haddock is cooked, you merely strain it, and back we come to that old white sauce, that basic white sauce. You then use the milk to make the basic white sauce, which we will now go and pick up, which I've already made with another batch of haddock at the table. Here it is. Now, the scallop haddock. We need the white sauce. This is a fish white sauce, of course, because it's made with the milk strongly flavoured of haddock. And it has the cheese in it, which makes it sauce morning, fish sauce morning, and it has, of course, its seasonings. So, that was stupid, wasn't it? So now we scrape it into this basin. And then we add to it the flaked haddock, which has already been cooked. Now, the flaked haddock, I want to show you, and I want to show you what's been taken away from it. I've kept it all so that you should miss nothing by not seeing that little bit of um, milk and fish cookery. Here is the haddock in the flakes, ready to put into the white sauce. Here, in this container, I'm going to tip it out onto this plate so that you can see, are the bits of skin that came away. So you have to discount that in estimating your qualities, because as you, quantities, because as you can see, there's quite a bit of skin. There's about three ounces there, judging from the feel in my hand. So now, I've got that out of the way, I mix the sauce, the cheese sauce, with its seasonings. No salt, I should I said it, I was wrong. It's only pepper, because of course there's a certain amount of salt in the habit. Here we are. And there's a little tiny bit of skin there, which we'll get away. Now, I mix those two together. That's the first part, really. The second part is another old friend of ours that we have made together, and that is the Duchess potato. You will remember that when we studied that, we saw that you first had to uh, steam the potatoes, and then you had to rub them through a sieve, and you had to dry them out with a wooden spoon in a clean, dry saucepan to get rid of the moisture, then add your egg yolk and your seasonings and butter and so on, and then it was ready to use. Because if we're going to have scalloped haddock, we want scallop shells. Here is one, and while I say a word to you about scallop shells, I'll pipe the Duchess potato around. It annoys me when we pay the price that real scallops cost, good fresh scallops. When all we get lumbered with is that nasty bit of flat shell. And the fishmonger sticks to the deep shells, which are so very useful. And after all, if you are buying the scallop, you're entitled to have the house that it lives in. So make a point of asking your fishmonger to give you the deep shell, not just the hollow one, will you? And then when you pipe the potato around, you see you simply put the filling in the middle, fill it right up with your haddock. So put it with the one that's already done onto the dish that will go into the oven and then add a couple of flakes of butter so that it gets a nice glaze on it when it's cooked. But you know, not only do you use these shells in cookery for all sorts of things, but if you can get the fishmonger to give you the thing in the shell and then you take the scallop out yourself, you get this pear joined by a mussel, which I find enchanting for making small flower arrangements. And I like to use up everything. Now this goes away in the oven at gas mark six for 20 to 25 minutes and there won't be enough time left in the programme for us to cook that one for you to see it's the only dish which in fact we have pre-cooked for you. So now let's have a look at our goujonade de sole. Let's turn them out on something nicer than the surface of the table. There they are. Two fillets of sole cut up into ribbons which you then take and fit into your little potato baskets. These are made a different shape from the pomme de fret you saw last time. I thought it would amuse you to see something to show you again variations on that theme. <laughs>
And you see, I'm having a hard job to get this amount, however carefully I pile them, into those two much larger potato baskets than the ones we made last time. And I think that makes two portions, and I'm reasonably sure you will too. <coughs> With them, of course, we must have lemon juice. And this we cut in the shape of baskets, and then we need some watercress to give us our colour contrast and to look nice with it, and indeed to eat. Now, you've got a couple of white paper doilies on the dish. You've got the rich, varied browns of all these crisp potatoes. You've got the clear yellow of the lemon, and the contrast of the bright green of this makes the whole dish look most attractive. And so let us take it over to another table and survey some of the things that we've been doing. <coughs> now, there are a few points to remember in going over the things that we've been doing. Why lemon baskets? Aren't they a bit fussy and fiddly? Well, you see, supposing you've got clean hands and you carefully manicured them and you're having a meal, you don't want to get them covered with little messy bits of lemon. These look pretty. And then, you see, you can take them and you can squeeze your juice over your portion. You put it back again, it still looks pleasant your hands are unmarked. Remember that you, these potato baskets can be made and stored for several weeks in an airtight tin in a dry place. You can get those out of the way for the largest possible parties. And remember when you're doing your sow, you can also use place if you prefer to use something less expensive. Here <coughs> we have the baked, uh, the, the scalloped haddock. And I think the main point's there to remind you about drying out that Dutchess potato when you make it. Otherwise, when you pipe it, it'll flop all over the place. You see it's got a nice golden brown on the top. And, of course, you can use any other fish that you can cook in milk and flake. So you can start with the humble cod and go on from there, things which are a great deal more expensive or elaborate. Now let's have a look at our gnocchi, our um, gochi gratinati, or mussels, which are baked. You see how the breadcrumbs have swollen and the cheese has melted, merged with the parsley and the mussels, and then there are two ways of eating them. You can be very gourmet and pick them up in your fingers and suck them off the shell and then scoop up the juice, or you can eat them more elegantly with a spoon and fork do see that you have that lovely juice with them. And then let's move over here and see what Simon has brought us now. Ah, the crepe, the pancakes with that fish filling. <coughs> well, I've already said to you about those that you can use the haddock mixture instead. But if you think of the sauce on top of those pancakes, which you pre-made, which makes life easier at the last moment, you realize that it's only milk made into sauce. And we did have a little cream so, of course, we can have top of the milk instead if you want to be economical. And because it's only milk, cream and cheese, we can use a fish filling, a meat filling, we can use leftovers of meat, leftovers of game or poultry, or indeed, if we're vegetarian, we can use vegetables and more cheese. So there are many variants vari vari on that theme. And so we come to this, <coughs> I'm afraid, far from inexpensive dish which I have here as a centrepiece. This is called an assiette des fruits de mer, a dish of the fruits of the sea. Seafoods which make a most lovely presentation dish on a buffet when you're going a bit grand. These are all, of course, fish that come from our English waters. Let's start here with the mussels and uh, with the uh, winkles, I mean, good old English winkles. And when you have them, you, of course, have to excavate them. So will you please, when you do so, see that you have a pin with a nice bright head on it, stuck in series of them, stuck into corks, so that people can see them if they drop one by accident and they won't get an ordinary dressmaker's pin mixed up in the brown bread and butter. In the centre, I have a brandy-shaped glass into the neck of which I've put all my prawns in a little ring all the way round. And then I have um, crayfish here and brown shrimps, cockles, and what else? Only this rather extravagant lobster. But that is only a small one and needn't be used on very many occasions. Next tonight, Ian Stewart's in Japan to explain the geological curse that's forced the huge population onto just a few overcrowded plains and what that means for the Japanese psyche. The last journey into the ring of fire in just a moment. <laughs> 